via um, LinkedIn and uh, Software AG. Uh, next speakers are Achana and Pooja are speaking from ThoughtWorks and BCG Digital Ventures. Um, I thought, hey, great to see you both again. Hey. We were, nice we to were see you again. Yeah, we were talking, was it London? No, it was New York? London, London. yes. London, it was London, yeah. We've been all around the world together this year. <laughs> Wonderful. So you'll be both speaking about creating the scalable ecosystems um, using microservices. Who's going to be presenting to start uh, with? That'll be me. Great. Okay. Um, Wonderful. Oh, I'll wait till you're on. Okay. And then if you can just swap to presentation mode. Of course. Excellent. Okay, I'll jump off. Looking forward to hearing you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, and we are very excited to be talking to you about this particular topic from Singapore and London, uh, India, respectively. Uh, I'm Archana. I'm a lead engineer at BCG Digital Ventures. And with me, I have Pooja, who is a lead consultant at ThoughtWorks Technologies. Um, in our time in the software industry, Pooja and I have worked on a lot of projects uh, where we've done transformation from legacy monoliths to microservices and also built microservices from scratch. And so this talk is just a distillation of all our experiences from the past and uh, what we think are the top 10 essential tips to make sure your microservices architecture is scalable as you add more complexity and capability to your environments. So I'll quickly jump in. Um, the first thing uh, which all of us start by doing, so the first thing we think of when we talk about microservices is domain-driven design and identifying the right service boundaries that will help us keep our service logic intact in different parts of the system. I think when we start out building microservices from scratch, almost all of us do a good job in identifying these service boundaries and they're almost always pretty good. The problem comes into play when the number of services that we have starts growing exponentially. So when we move from 10, 20 services to 50, 100 services, or even a few hundred services, that explosion in the number of services usually causes us to look for uh, more creative ways of uh, breaching these service boundaries. So in one of the projects that I was on, um, we had an order service. And one of the teams came up with this idea of creating a data model library with an order service, which could then be packaged and shared outside order service. So another service, for example, a payment service, can import this library and use it to directly access the order service database. Um, while this might sound like a good idea, it's actually not. It's a big anti-pattern because you are exposing something that's core to your system, the schema of your database with an order service to a service that's outside the boundary. So doing this, uh, while it might make data access pretty easy, it uh, complicates uh, any changes that you might have to do to the schema and order service from that point onwards. And such changes are really hard to find out and debug and troubleshoot, especially when they blow up on the production environments, which is why it's not a good idea to um, share data stores outside your service. Uh, so it's really important to keep your data models very different from your contracts and ensure that your data is exposed only via well-defined APIs, which gives you a lot more control in how this data is accessed, what sort of authentication needs to be in place for someone to consume your data within your service. The next uh, point is around how these APIs get exposed. So uh, following up on the last talk about service mesh, uh, uh, I think I don't have to go into a lot of details about meshes particularly, but there's a couple of different ways in which you can expose your APIs. So obviously, the API gateway is something we're all aware of, and it can be used very intelligently to expose the APIs in a few different ways. So um, uh, you could have a different logic that controls how your APIs are exposed to internal customers and external customers. Maybe they get different rates at which they can access this API and so on and so forth. So the API gateway is a nice little place to put in all that logic that um, controls routing, uh, rate limiting, 
even basic authentication checks so that you know any unauthenticated request does not go past that layer into your services ecosystem so you could put in a check that ensures that the jwt in your header is valid uh, before forwarding that request to a downstream service However, the flip side to this is to ensure that uh, you do not get too excited and add a lot of business logic in your gateway, especially as the number of services grow. Any issue that you face because of complex logic in the gateway is going to be very difficult to debug and understand what the root cause of the issue is. So it's a... Uh, it's a fine balance to tread, but if utilized effectively, the API gateway can be a great place for you to put in some of those um, cross-functional requirements into. The other option is uh, service mesh, like it was discussed in detail in the previous topic, so I won't go into a lot of details here, but it's a good idea to place a sidecar or a proxy which separates your application logic from your uh, um, orthogonal requirements like request response logging, tracing, load balancing, etc. So it gives a sort of nice manageability to your application logic. The next item um, is around choosing the right communication protocol. So um, I'm sure we are all very familiar with choosing between synchronous and asynchronous uh, protocols, choosing what is the right fit for the right purpose. Um, it's just that when we think about asynchronous calls, uh, there's a few different uh, perspectives that you need to keep in mind. Um, so for example, I was on, once on this project where we had to onboard users into the system. The way we did it was we'd get these Excel files with a lot of users. And then the user gets onboarded by creating a user ID for them in one service, onboarding their dependents in another service, and then sending out an email saying that you've been onboarded successfully. So as, as you you can see it goes through a different, a few different services. So we chose to implement it in an asynchronous way, which was, which seemed like the right fit for that problem. However, we had to deal with um, ensuring that the transaction boundary went across all these services. So if one service fails, we had to make sure that the call did not go to a downstream service. But then we also had to deal with the question of how do we deal with this error? So do we roll back? the request that was already executed in service one if the call to service two failed? Or do we retry in service two a few times? And then if that doesn't work, you push that request into a dead letter queue so that someone can manually intervene and fix the problem. Again, the uh, problem and the solution to the problem depends very much on who your users are, what the use case is, and what is the right approach to take at that point in time. Similarly, uh, REST, were, REST and JSON versus gRPC with protopuff is also becoming a fairly common question these days. And the way you think about it is REST and JSON is pretty standard. It's almost universally accepted. Most of your clients would be able to consume that very easily. Uh, whereas gRPC and protopuff, they also bring in a lot of advantages. It's very succinct. You don't have to create client libraries from scratch for every different programming language. Um, but in order to effectively implement that, you need to make sure that your team is very disciplined and they follow a strict convention when it comes to uh, growing the schema, right? So I think a lot of this depends on not just the use case, but also the maturity of your team that's implementing the services and also the um, scope of control that you get as the number of services grows. The next item is uh, about versioning your APIs. This is also... Um, a long running problem that we all have. So there's a couple of different ways in which the APIs can be provisioned. So you have two examples here on the screen. So the first approach is you expose multiple versions of your API uh, from the same service, and then different clients consume these APIs. Or the second approach is to uh, have a different version of service for different versions of APIs that you want to host. Both approaches are acceptable. The first one has uh, quite a bit of application complexity to it. The second one has more deployment complexity to it. But in both approaches, I think it's important to address some uh, uh, prominent questions. So the first one is, how many versions are you going to maintain compatibility for? Um, how do you ensure that some of your older clients have access to the APIs that they need? How do you ensure that there's backward compatibility? But also, the flip side is, how do you ensure that you decommission the older versions timely in a timely manner? Because all of these actually come with a, a significant maintenance and management overhead. 
and irrespective of which of the approach you choose between these two it's very important to follow a very consistent strategy for versioning across all your services because this problem um grows exponentially as the number of services you have grow and when there are inter service dependencies for different version of the apis you have to be very careful that everybody follows the standard practice now as your api ecosystem is growing and you have more and more services it is really important to start thinking about performance of services and there is no silver bullet to solve this problem unlike unless it's like a monolith where you can think about a few different approaches to tackle maybe different parts of the application microservices um you have to think about the uh, sort of where each service fits into the ecosystem and how you can be creative about making the services performant it's obviously uh, easier to scale microservices to make them performant than scaling or making a monolith performant and um, so some common approaches is you know you can cache data where possible you can try to optimize data storage by giving a different instance for read for write um, but which solution you choose depends on what the problem is that you face so there could be like uh, i am sure we've all been in situations where we wake up one fine day and our services are crashing and we don't know what happened we have not done any deployment recently and then you realize some other team has released a new feature which is maybe causing increased request to your service which is then causing your service to crash or somebody has made contract changes to downstream systems um without informing you and that's causing issues in your service So depending on what the problem is you can leverage one of these different types of uh, solutions to fix the problem and um, the service mesh that we spoke about earlier is also a good um, uh, thing to use for load balancing and scaling um another useful thing to do is to run periodic performance tests against your application against your service that you own so that you have sls that you can then tag against your service so you know exactly what the boundaries of your service are and you know exactly when you have to go for horizontal scaling once we have done all of this we have a lot of microservices there will be problems that we don't know how to solve so this is when observability comes into play unfortunately we are all not like chuck norris we can't just uh, stare down the code and hope that it confesses what the problem is so i will hand over to pooja now to talk about what observability and what are the things to keep in mind when making sure your systems are observable yeah hey thanks archana um so a key metric for uh, any application is the turnaround time that um, one has to do a root cause analysis for a production issue in a distributed system where you have multiple microservices interacting with each other it becomes nearly impossible to identify the problem by just manually trying to reproduce the issue on lower environments right because there are multiple things that could have uh, caused the said issue and it could be pertaining only to the production uh, environment this is why uh, observability becomes all the more critical in such applications so what we've depicted here is uh, one way to think about building up your applications uh, observability maturity so you start with having proper logging telemetry health checks for your applications uh, when i say proper i mean ensuring that the logs are in the right level um you ensure that there are uh, you know successful um, ways to track each of the log statements through multiple services having a consistent log structure so that um, you know it's easier for you to query um, logs and figure out what the problem is um another aspect to keep in mind is to ensure the traceability of requests uh, so like i mentioned how do you know that a request arriving at a particular service let's say a payment service is connected to a service um, is connected to a request that is going to an order service right it could be a, a single request that's spanning multiple microservices so that's where things like correlation id res request response tracers uh, come into play um adhering to these uh, principles right it's particularly important because this is what will help you in uh, log aggregations and profilings uh, that eventually drive your monitoring and troubleshooting capabilities so um if you have centralized dashboards based off of your logs um then you can display you know different metrics like your error rates or business metrics based on which some of your um, you know features could even get built in your products um for example in one of the uh, e-commerce clients that i worked for um we used these kind of centralized dashboards to report the number of successful order placements um failed orders uh, conversion rates from a cart to an order um and 
such business metrics and this was uh, a key factor in driving some of our business requirements for the application itself and um, the elk stack pattern uh, that that's quite popular in terms of uh, providing um, uh, you know uh, ability to query analyze and visualize your logs um, and that's what we've been using in most of our uh, projects as well um, the next aspect that I wanted to highlight um, was testing. Um, so most of you would already be aware of this test pyramid. We've seen it quite often. Um, in the microservices world, there are just a couple of steps that might be um, slightly additional, and that's what I'll uh, talk about today. Uh, the first is the uh, integration testing layer. Uh, here, what you typically do is to test all the integration points that your code has, uh, be it uh, an integration with the database or an external service itself. What I'd like to highlight in this layer is the service visualization, sorry, service virtualization technique. Um, what this means is if one service is dependent on another service and you want to test the source service, you would typically mock um, the dependent service on and make it return some dummy data so that the service that you're testing is uh, tested thoroughly irrespective of what the data um, is from your dependent services. So for example, if you're testing something in the order service that's dependent on, let's say, an inventory data, you would probably stub out the inventory data and allow the core, allow testing of the core functionality of the order service itself. So this would ensure that your order service tests do not fail because of reason that's not pertaining to the order service. Um, and, 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 you know, and you'll be able to holistically test your order service itself. Uh, the question that might arise uh, here is if you're mocking the external service itself, how do we test the actual interaction with the service and ensure that it doesn't fail um, in a continuous request, right? So that's where your contract testing uh, comes into play. Uh, Consumer-driven contract testing is one of the ways by which consumers of a service or an API will hold the service or the API provider accountable for sticking to a given defined contract be it um, the URL or the request or the response, these automated contract tests would fail if there is a change to any of these uh, parameters in the request. Um, for example, uh, we've used uh, PACT and Spring Cloud uh, contracts as um, some frameworks in our projects earlier. Um, so if you move on to the next one, um, yeah, so th this is probably one of the least favorites for developers, right? It's uh, documentation uh, but unfortunately I don't think we can get away with this because uh, it's not just you touching the code there are a lot of developers working on the same um, service code base right so um, what do you folks think is the most difficult part of documentation uh, maybe you can just drop a note on the chat uh, message itself um, for me the most important the most biggest challenge has been to keep the documentation itself up to date right it it's very easy for documentation to go out of date um, unless you s dedicate specific amount of time to uh, sit and re renew it. Um, so one of the ways that I've found personally effective for documenting is by writing good tests. Um, the reason I believe this is very effective is because tests evolve organically with code and hence there's no additional maintenance overhead that you need um, in order to maintain these tests itself. So what you only have to ensure is that when you're writing tests, ensure that they are very descriptive and they cover the different scenarios that are possible um, according to your functionalities. Uh, secondly, if you're exposing APIs as a product to multiple consumers, you could integrate with a tool like um, Swagger to, that would uh, automate to an extent API contract definitions. And this, this can then serve as your documentation for consumers. And the last thing that I would like to highlight here is uh, with a lot of moving parts, um, it does become important to document your key architectural decisions because uh, the reason behind a certain choice can go, uh, can get lost if you don't um, document it at the right time. So um, in order to have this traceability into time as to why a certain decision was taken at any given point in time, uh, you could maintain architectural decision records uh, that will help you that will help serve as an audit trail for the various decisions that are made. Um, if we go on to the next one. Yeah. So now that we have built uh, scalable services that are well tested and documented, um, is that good enough for us? Uh, because I'd, any, any application is incomplete without thinking about security. And that's one of the major cross-cutting concerns in every application. 
So as you see in the diagram here, uh, you will have to um, think about security at every layer, right from the database to the code that you're writing um, in the services to the infrastructure that's hosting each of your services. Uh, and each of these layers need to be um, secured in one way or the other. Um, so, for example, if you have coded a particular functionality, um, security can't be an afterthought. I don't think it's um, it's scalable to say, hey, I finished this functionality. Let me come back and you know revisit the security aspect of this code. It's just going to be too time consuming and unnecessary complexity. So it's very important that you bake in security right from the start. And what we've mentioned here are just a few measures that you could take to secure your application. Um, for example, you should ensure TLS to secure any communication within your APIs, uh, especially the external APIs. Uh, ensure to authenticate and authorize every request that is coming um, using mechanisms like identity tokens and access tokens. Uh, think about security of sensitive data, whether it's data that you're storing at rest or whether it's uh, data in transit. Um, and as Archana mentioned earlier, you could use uh, API gateways to provide this additional layer of security. For example, rate limiting to prevent unwanted DDoS attacks on your services. And you ensure that it's not just the application, right? It's also the infrastructure that, that is supporting the application that needs to be secure as well. And uh, there, there are a lot of measures that you could take to um, you know, secure your infrastructure as well. Um, the last thing that I'd like to leave you with is um, uh, be careful not to end up uh, building a distributed monolith. Right? So as uh, Archana mentioned in the start, you would uh, apply principles like domain-driven design to identify boundaries of your services. But uh, that's not just a one-time process. Now, as your system evolves and functionalities continue to uh, be built, uh, some of these common patterns uh, need to be kept in mind and not forgotten. So for example, you should ensure that you don't fall into the trap of building a distributed monolith. Um, and you should be able to uh, you know, still deploy your services independently. You should still ensure that you know, failure of one microservices does not cascade failures into multiple other services. So all of these um, principles are something that you should keep in mind to avoid building a distributed monolith. And this is evolving. It's not like a one-time activity. Um, for example, in one of the projects that uh, we had worked on, uh, the biggest trouble was going to um, with going to production was coordinated releases between different services. Um, now, the, each of the services were owned by different teams, and there was no clear boundaries uh, or well separation between them, and that caused a lot of dependencies between the teams itself to go live. And one team could not go live without uh, talking to the other teams, so that was a real challenge for us. Um, so it's advisable to not store. Um, so one other thing is, it's you should be you should ensure that you don't store the same data in multiple services. So there's no duplicate uh, between the services. Um, but you know you'll have to ensure that there is no chattiness either between services to get these data. So it's at the end of the day a fine balance that you'll have to draw between the two. Um, so to sum it all up, um, these are the ten commandments uh, that we think would help you. Um, while creating and maintaining your microservices. Um, happy to take questions. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag when we rejoin. Uh, thanks, I'm glad you put up your contact details here, both of you. Um, there was one question Baptiste Kapar has asked, any advice to decommission APIs when changing, because changing versions costs time and money to partners. So how do you, what's the advice you would give around decommissioning APIs um, in this sort of uh, model? So I think personally, I the approach I've taken is to uh, push that point where you have to version your APIs as far out as possible. So in most situations, your requirements, you could um, live without versioning your APIs as long as the contract changes are additive. So you're adding new fields and you're not changing anything that's already there. You're not deleting anything that's already there. You can live with different um, versions of the models without actually versioning out your APIs. 
the point when you hit multiple APIs and you have to decommission it, I think it's important to have enough metrics that can support your decision on how many consumers are dependent on a specific version of an API and how what is your plan to allow them to upgrade to the newer version of the API. And then it has to be a targeted activity where you encourage them to move over and then you decommission the existing APIs. Okay, uh, we've got one more question. I'll ask you to um, drop off the slide deck though, though now. Stay on, uh, stay on just to ask, um, just so your faces are bigger, that's better. Um, if we follow domain-driven design uh, and domain APIs, then there will be implicit dependency. What do you suggest on that uh, particular here he has asked? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, definitely. So one of the things that you have to keep in mind when you follow de domain driven design is that you should be ready to cut and chop your services or group them together to form one big service as you grow, as your requirements evolve based on how your system changes. And if you're not uh, able to do that for whatever reason, you can then become really creative and start caching some of the data in one of the services that is coming from a downstream service. But be really careful about how you'll invalidate it and always make sure that this is all done via APIs and not by directly accessing the data store. Thanks. That's great. We There's also other questions, but perhaps after you yeah. get off the stage, if you could follow up on the um, group chat uh, well, but there's some questions around dependencies there. It's a topic everyone will be interested in seeing your replies to. Um, thank you both. Great to meet with you again and uh, hear what you. you've been up to. Yep.